This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, and welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Laura Lodka. Today in studio, we have someone whose voice you'll probably recognize from Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. We have uh, Dr. Matt Springer. Matt is an assistant extension professor of wildlife management in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. It's a pleasure to have you back again today. Glad to be here. So before we get started talking about the most common wildlife questions, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do at UK. Sure. So um, originally I am from Pennsylvania, downtown Pennsylvania, which is about an hour north of Philadelphia. It's our third largest city. I'm a city kid at heart. Um, thankfully, uh, my family got me out in the outdoors and uh, along the Appalachian Trail. I was only grew up about an hour from the Appalachian Trail. Mm-hmm. Uh, so eastern Kentucky is kind of like home, you know, close to home a little bit and Lexington yeah. is too. Um, but I went to school for my undergraduate at a small school in, in Pennsylvania, in the middle of Pennsylvania, about 45 minutes south of Penn State. Um, that I got an environmental science degree. Uh, luckily, my um, school there had a lot of outdoor classes, so I got to go outside quite a bit, uh, engage in water quality research and wildlife research and those kind of things. From there, I worked for the Pennsylvania Game Commission um, and did deer research, was involved with their deer research program, mm-hmm. um, enjoyed it a lot, decided that that's kind of what I wanted to do, um, particularly within the wildlife field. Uh, took a master's position at the University of Delaware, worked on ag damage work with whitetail deer there. From there, I went to SIU Carbondale in Southern Illinois, uh, did some more deer research to get my PhD, uh, focusing on movement and disease, uh, and that brought me here uh, to Lexington. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, the job I accepted here at Lexington is the Extension Wildlife State Extension Specialist uh, and also Assistant Professor. So my duties revolve around extension, uh, then also a little bit of teaching and research relating to extension uh, applied research, really. So I am a responsible for public questions regarding wildlife in all forms mm-hmm. from the state of Kentucky. That interaction with landowners is pretty broad. It's um, if any questions uh, at all from them uh, involve wildlife or wildlife habitat or wildlife damage, um, my job responsibilities are to help them in in whatever way I can. Um, Sometimes that may be just informing them of their legal uh, issues and whether or not they can do certain things legally. Uh, Others may be how do you um, proactively prevent uh, issues or um, maybe attract more animals to your property. Uh, so it, 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 it's wide-ranging and very um, situational. Uh, but a lot of times I am uh, responding to various different wildlife needs from state, federal agencies, uh, to the individual landowner that may own uh, one little plot of land that's a third of an acre or less. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about wildlife extension um, and what you do. But before you get into that, tell us what extension is in general. Sure. So extension... Um, at the heart of it is really delivering education from either um, research uh, or what's going on at at universities um, that is really applicable to to everyone's life, uh, how to improve their life, whether that be uh, farming, but it's also, you know, every day in your household, uh, how to, you know, can uh, vegetables better so you are more nutritious. Uh, For me, it's, you know, my position is how do I either Uh, get more wildlife around because that's what I desire or how do I um, help deal with problems that are associated with wildlife that we have in Kentucky, uh, whether that be in a farm uh, or even in your everyday house uh, within your neighborhoods. So what got you interested in the wildlife aspect of it? Sure. So the wildlife side, uh, I kind of briefly mentioned my family, get make sure I was outside. Um, My father uh, in particular and my grandparents on both sides, uh, grandfathers, uh, would take me outside. I would go chasing tadpoles, those kind of things, uh, go fishing, um, hunting quite a bit. Uh, so they really um, got me outside and interested in wildlife related to you know the, what we would call in our field the traditional hook and bullet. 
Um, but I also always had an appreciation for most of the species I saw. Um, thankfully, you know, my, my parents continued to foster that. Uh, my mom wouldn't kick me out whenever I bring the snakes and fish I'd catch it and outside of frogs and bring them home and say, I want to keep them as a pet. Uh, she'd tolerate it for a couple days at least. Um, <laughs> so that was there in this terms of support. And then uh, going forward and deciding that, you know, um, I actually come from a teaching family and uh, have, you know, many aunts and uncles that are teachers. Um, so I thought I might want to go into that, but, um, really it, it was out, outdoors one out and, um, went to school for it and, you know, they supported me all the way through, uh, regardless of the fact that, the um, the income outlook wasn't great. Um, they said, you'd rather be happy than not, uh, with going to work every day. Uh, so thankfully they did and here I am. Great. Thank you. So you mentioned research as part of your position. So what type of research are you doing right now? So... Um, currently, I have three master's students. Um, two of them are working on wildlife damage projects. One of them is Jonathan Matthews is working on a project with white-tailed deer out in western Kentucky with uh, corn and soybean yields mm -hmm. uh, and deer's in, their impact on those uh, production areas. Um, trying to incorporate some estimation of deer density and does the amount of deer in the area actually correlate to the damage to the crops if it exists. Um, so that's one project I have going on. The other wildlife damage project is just starting. Um, I have Jenna Nyerman is the student's name, and she is uh, going to be looking at voles within soybean fields. Um, and uh, we're seeing a problem right now uh, in some of the areas of the state where voles, um, which seem to be existing in the cover crops that we put down for all the good soil health and erosion control things, um, as producers um, spray to kill those to plant, um, the voles don't go away, and then they eat all of the soybeans that are planted. Mm. Uh, so we're looking at how big of a problem is this, and is there a sol practical solution for, for uh, our producers to go in and maybe kill the cover crops a couple weeks earlier, which would potentially get rid of all the food and cover for the voles, and then they'd have to leave, is the thought. So we're, we're trying to get that started this winter, and um, that'll be up and going. And both those projects are actually funded by the Kentucky Soybean Board. Uh, and then the, the Deer Project, Jonathan's Project, has some um, grant money that comes from the Corn Growers Association as well. The third student I have, Gabrielle Wolf, I, she's co-advised, uh, like Jonathan is, with uh, John Cox in the department. She's working on a project on otters in New Mexico to reintroduce population. We're looking at some diet issues, uh, whether or not they're eating some of the game fish, so there's some endangered and threatened species in the same area, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out if they're actually causing maybe some potential issues with those species, mm -hmm. uh, or if just causing fishermen problems, uh, which some of our fishermen in this state complain about otters, uh, specifically one that is my boss. Um, <laughs> but um, they are a part of a system, and there's um, some benefits of having otters around as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's those uh, projects are going. On top of that, uh, we have some uh, landowner projects with um, woodland owners uh, and oak supply with Laura, who's sitting in the room here, is one <laughs> of the people involved with that, among many others in forestry extension and some of our other faculty within the department. And then um, have a couple of undergraduates that are working on things from um, uh, microbeads and microplastics in systems to um, now uh, looking at conservation programs Mm -hmm. and their persistence on uh, after the programs end. So we have the, the CREP program, which is 100,000 acres in South Central Kentucky. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to get renewed in the Farm Bill. So we have about 3,000 contracts that are now not going to be in existence anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was one of our biggest wildlife victories and, and, and Green River water quality victories. So we're trying to figure out what are the landowners going to do and how can we help them to preserve as much of that wildlife habitat, soil quality, you know, soil issues in terms of erosion control and soil health. How do we preserve as much of that as possible? And then also from the extension side, how do we help those landowners transition into a, a different land, whether it be production, uh, and how do we do that in a way that is efficient and um, allows them to try to conserve as much natural resources as possible, but also make a profit. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of your most wildlife questions that you get from landowners or just the general public um, in general. So um, we basically have a list here that we're going to ask you that you have provided us. And so the number one question is, is this a copperhead? Yes, this this, and I believe the number two question are very similar. Yes. Um, 
the one thing that um, lights up my email box every day with several emails is, can you identify this snake? I'm pretty sure it's a copperhead. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, um, almost 99% of them are not copperheads. I guess fortunate for the folks that uh, are concerned about, you know, whether or not they have to... Uh, be worried about their kid children potentially getting bit by a copperhead right. um, but unfortunately the majority of those pictures are dead snakes so um, most of those snakes are actually beneficial to have around uh, your rat snakes or king snakes which actually eat venomous snakes as they're part of their diet mm. uh, usually um, do not fare so well when they're seen mm -hmm. um, but so, um, you know there's that is probably the number one thing that I get asked on a daily basis is, can you identify the snake and is it a copperhead? Um, so we try to inform them that, you know, what features to look for uh, on the snake that would help them identify future snakes when they come across them, because they will. We have a lot of snakes. We're over 30 different snake species in the state of Kentucky. Um, the big ones that we talk about are the Hershey Kiss pattern uh, on copperheads where they have that dark marking. If you look from the bottom of the snake up to the top, it looks kind of like a Hershey Kiss. Um, the triangle-ish shape head, uh, the slits, pupils, uh, which if you're close enough to look at the slit of the pupil of the eye, you're probably a little too close little too anyway. Close. Yes. Um, but they do have a distinctive pattern and um, it's unfortunate that we have a lot of species of snakes that have a pattern um, to them, which is why folks tend to get worried and confused about what snake they're seeing. Uh, but we always say if you're, you know, if you are concerned and you can't identify it, obviously don't touch it, don't go near it. Um, we don't encourage the killing of the snakes, but if you are concerned, then, um, you know, obviously don't play with it. Um, right. Most of the time, they will leave the area pretty quickly. They don't want to be around you just as much as you don't want to be around them. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, we push, put um, folks or tell them about our Kentucky snake identification webpage, which we have uh, at our forestry extension site. Um, that will help them identify whatever snake they see by some certain features. And um, it's got a uh, part of that allows you to walk through based on what you see and where you are to identify the snake you have. Yeah, so there's actually drop down menus on that that you can say, yes, it has this kind of pattern and what have you. Absolutely. We had people that were very good at making things work very well on that project. So <laughs> um, it is relatively easy to use for the majority of the public. And along with a lot of great pictures, too, there's, that people can see. There's a see. lot of pictures there mm -hmm. to help you. A juvenile uh, and, snake to heads yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's one of the features we try to talk about with copperheads. Sometimes it's the smaller snakes um, that are banded, uh, like a juvenile black rat snake, is a, is a pretty distinctive banding. Uh, and folks get confused with that with copperheads pretty regularly. Um, juvenile copperheads have a bright green tail. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's an easy feature for, for you to use to um, identify them versus a small rat snake. Okay. So we well, already went over number two, I guess, is this poisonous. Or is there something else you'd like Correct. to say about so, that? Correct. Yeah. So number one is, is this a copperhead? And the second most po uh, common question I get is, is this poisonous? Uh, which they are not poisonous. They're venomous. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of falls into, uh, so we get some confusion with uh, rattlesnakes on occasion. Um, and so some folks think that it's a potentially a rattlesnake. Um, and usually those are pretty easy to identify based on the tail. However, sometimes you can't see the entire snake. So uh, there's obvious concern there. But that, that really is the number two question I get on a regular basis is, is this poisonous? Uh, which is really, is this venomous? Um, and can you tell the dip, explain why, what the difference is between poisonous and venomous? Sure. Poisonous is something like a berry. Or if you poison someone, they usually consume it, right? Uh, versus venomous, which is an actual uh, active... Um, inserting of uh, toxin into your system where you know a snake bites you with its fangs and inserts the the, the uh, toxic uh, mm -hmm. substance so um, there is a difference there and um, I guess you could consider a snake poisonous if you eat its head I don't know um, <laughs> but uh, usually most folks aren't doing that um, so how many venomous snakes do we have so we have four different species but the most common are, are copperhead and timber rattlesnake okay we have the other one, if you're out in western Kentucky, that's fairly common, especially if you're near water bodies. And I'm talking far west, so uh, the, the Purchase Penny Rider region mm -hmm. uh, is the cottonmouth, uh, is, or water moccasin is the other name for it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're also relatively common. We have a second species of rattlesnake that is really, really rare. Um, pygmy, it's, it's in the land between the lakes, is really the only spots found in there. They're, I mean we may not have triple digit numbers of individuals. Mm. It's very rare. So, um, but that's one that people do ID to it uh, quite a bit on the page. 
um, especially uh, because there's um, certain species of rat snake that are very similar to it in, pa in pattern and banding color. So uh, it is really though very concentrated to the land between the lakes area. You've been listening to From the Woods Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay, before we get back to our main segment, we're going to listen to our wildlife sounds from the forest. And for those of you that might be new listeners to our show, each week we're going to have a, a brief sound bite for a wildlife sounds from the forest. And Dr. Matt Springer will introduce that sound. And then later in the show, we'll hear kind of his explanation of what the animal is and a full, a full description of what that sound is. So let's, let's listen to Dr. Springer. For our segment on wildlife sounds of the forest, we're going to cover this noise here. Later on today's show of Wildlife Sounds from the Forest, you're going to find out what made that sound, why did it make it, and other interesting facts that relate to that specific animal or other animals that are closely related to that. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. So question number two on your uh, most common wildlife, or excuse me, question number three for your most common wildlife questions is uh, what food plot should I plant for deer? Yeah, so um, white-tailed deer are um, our most popular game mammal in the world. Uh, we are a top five Boone and Crockett state for deer hunting. Uh, we have over 300,000 people that deer hunt in Kentucky each mm -hmm. year. Uh, so this, this one is a popular question because there's a lot of folks that uh, really interested in deer hunting, uh, want to get a little active, they may have 20 acres, 15 acres, uh, and want to attract more deer or hold more deer in that property. So um, there's a, um, a lot of folks that are doing food plots now as part of their game management strategies. And there's 50 so different things you can plant for a food plot. So everyone wants to know what's the best so I get the advantage over my neighbor. Uh, and the answer to that is it depends. Uh, so it's a real straightforward answer. Um, and the things that you want to consider when you make a choice is uh, really what do you have on your property that's food for deer? Um, what do your neighbors have? So if you have a 20 acre block of forest and you're surrounded by soybeans and corn and you have a little one acre field in the middle of it, you probably don't want to plant soybeans or corn because they can get a lot more of it on your neighbor's property. So you may want to choose something that's more nutritious at a different time period um, or offers a little more cover or different nutritional value at different times of the year. So we always talk about, A, you want to plant something that you can manage easily or you know you can manage it based on your time and access. So if you don't have a whole lot of time, you may want to plant something like clover, which will last a couple years and you don't have to do a lot of work to maintain it during the year. Whereas something like if you put corn or soybean in, you have to, you're farming. Mm -hmm. And all the problems that are associated with it, weed control, and so on and so forth. So you want to make sure you think about soil quality, what you can grow. Soil tests are a good thing. How much maintenance do you have to do? Can I access it easily? And then what else is available on the landscape? And do I want to try to compete with a bigger food source, or should I offer something different? Mm -hmm. Okay. So question number four, what's, what's the best thing to feed birds at the bird feeder? First, the only time you really want to be feeding birds uh, or the only time they really need to be fed is uh, late fall, winter, early spring. That's when food is a limiting factor in the landscape. Otherwise, uh, food at a feeder really isn't helping them too much um, during the other periods of time. Mm -hmm. And if you're down in southeast Kentucky or an area in eastern Kentucky that has bears, it's a concern. <laughs> yeah. So we want to make sure we talk about, you know, they don't need food during spring, summer, and, f and early fall. It's the winter that you need to feed them. And one of the best things you can give them is uh, black oiled sunflower seeds. Uh, it keeps the um, majority of the birds that visit bird feeders all like that. It's a high value food source. Uh, it also is one that is not uh, usually used by our pest birds, so our English sparrows and our starlings. So it's a great uh, alternative. Uh, they have uh, options at the store that have mixes in there of milo and sunflowers and a few other seeds. They're good, but they'll attract those pest birds. Um, so the sunflower seeds help limit that uh, while providing a really solid food source. 
Now, the other thing um, you can look at are soot feeders, uh, which are designed to feed things like woodpeckers and nut hatches. Mm -hmm. They're great to use and um, kind of follow the same rules as the bird feeders for the traditional bird feeders. Okay. So um, question number five on your list is, uh, what's eating my garden or landscaping? Yes, probably deer. Um, <laughs> so this is one uh, one of my responsibilities that is pretty heavy in terms of my workload is wildlife damage work. And that could be at the level of a farm with soybeans and corn and deer, bears, and raccoons getting into that. Uh, but there's a lot more people that garden than they farm. Uh, so I get this question quite regularly. And we have a lot of species of wildlife that kind of live on the fringe of urban suburban settings uh, or right next to your house in, in the middle of nowhere. We produce food and gardens or landscaping that is very nutritious for them and they're quick to identify it. So this is a common problem. And we have... A couple things that we want to look for when you're having issue uh, with garden or landscaping. You try to figure out where, you know, is this on a plant that's five foot tall uh, or is it right along the ground? In, unfortunately, that doesn't usually knock out a whole lot of options, but things like rabbits, a rabbit can't chew something from a tree. Pretty much everything else can though. But uh, deer may not be able to, to get to it. So we get, you know, situations with like apple trees and the apples are missing from the top of the tree. That's eight feet in the air. Well, deer really can't get to that, but a raccoon can or a bear can, mm -hmm. uh, possums, but it does help eliminate some things. So we try to use common sense with what we know may be in the area in terms of wildlife and how do you um, see them acting? Are they capable of getting to it or not? Uh, we look at the damage to the plant. Is it nipped off? Is that nip, that cut on the plant at an angle? Deer don't actually have upper teeth outside of their molars, so they have a very distinctive cutting pattern from those lower incisors. or it's a slight angle. Whereas like a rabbit or a groundhog has a very clean cross cut. Uh, so that helps narrow things down. We look for things like tracks or scat. Uh, although they don't, you know, definitely point to those things that produce those as the culprit, they help you narrow down what's in the area. Uh, we usually tell folks that, you know, we have trail cameras that are relatively cheap. We use them a lot for hunting kind of activities, but there's a lot of people that use them now for just what's in my backyard. If you have one of those, put it up where you're having the problem, and that really helps narrow things down if you can get a picture of the culprit. One of the examples I like to use is uh, Billy Thomas, one of our extension foresters, lives here in Lexington, and he had out I believe it was uh, cucumber seeds that he had planted in his garden, and he was accusing the squirrels of, of eating all his cucumber seeds. And I had said, well, here, use this barley's camera. I, I could use some pictures of culprits for my work here at Extension. And he put it out and found out that his dog was actually the problem and not wildlife at all. <laughs> so um, you want to make sure you try to take as many steps as possible and narrow it down because dealing with the problem comes down to knowing what species is causing it because there's a lot of different ways uh, you have to to uh, manage different species. Okay, so question number six is, how do I get this bat out of my house? <laughs> that is a I've difficult that one, and, and it's a common one. Um, a lot of times our houses or barns offer great roosting habitat for bats. Um, they can get in something as small as a nickel in diameter and size. Wow. So they, they are very good at getting into houses or small areas, uh, living inside walls. And the ants, you know, how do I get the bat out of the house? Well, it depends on where the bat is. If it's inside your walls, you really have to wait for them to come out at night and then figure out where they're coming out and seal that spot up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to think about what time of the year could it be? Is it possible that they have babies in there? And then you have concerns about that. Um, one of the things you definitely do not want to do is grab the bat with your hands and throw it outside. Uh, bats are our number one, one of our top rabies carriers in the state of Kentucky. We've heard a couple positives in Lexington this year and in Frankfurt where it was one, a couple in the school. Mm -hmm. So you do not want to ever touch them with your bare hands. And if you do touch them, you want to have heavy, heavy leather gloves on. Mm -hmm. um, you can do, there's, you know, old wife's tale tricks about turning lights on and off in the house where the bat will go to where, um, you know, the lights on or off. And sometimes people sit, mix, it, uh, mix it up. It will go to areas that have a you know it depends on the individual i've had to go opposite ways where one went to the light and one went to the dark so you may just have to play around with the light and see which way it goes 
but we'll you just can, open the door. Just and open flew the out. doors and <laughs> windows. Yeah, if they can, they, they don't usually want to be somewhere they're getting right. you know, harassed. So um, you don't want to do the great outdoors style where you're out there with the badminton. You know, <laughs> right. uh, not a great you know thing. Usually, if you can you know tolerate them, they're not going to attack you. Um, they're not aggressive like that. You, they will fly around and they may look like they're going to fly into you. Just stay still. They'll fly right by your head. They're really, <laughs> really uh, agile uh, in flight. But if you can get it out of the house, the, the trouble then is figure out how they got in. And that can be complicated and time consuming, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, if it comes to where you have a, a large roost in your house, you're probably going to have to involve a professional animal control mm -hmm. entity. Uh, and that can be quite expensive. Okay, so question number seven, is this animal feces and what's it from? You use the proper term, it's poop, <laughs> come on. Uh, no, so it, the proper term is actually scat. So um, yeah, I get a lot of pictures of what's this from, uh, kind of what's this poop from, what's this scat from, uh, and it, it depends on the size. That's the first thing we look at, consistency. If it's a fluid-like consistency then it's usually a bird or a reptile if it's a, a so more solid or mushy darker that's usually a mammal um, and it really depends on where it's found um, we often look at what's inside of it if there's insect parts a lot of times it's you know a bat uh, if there's fur then it might be a bobcat or a coyote or um, usually not bear bear there's usually fruit um, and and uh, seeds um, or, you know, the size, if it's as big as your hand, you know, it's got to be a big animal. Mm -hmm. uh, like if it's really small, it's probably a small one. There's consistency where rabbits actually will have two types of scat. The one that they poop and then eat again as part of their digestive system. And one that's really dry that is when they're completely done. It's been processed twice. Hmm. So it, it really depends. But there is a couple, uh, some information out there and a key that you can follow from the University of Nebraska Center of Wildlife Damage Management uh, that you can look at it and it has a step-by-step -step key and a lot of that's based on size and consistency. So question number eight is, is logging bad for wildlife? So this is one that is is fairly common whenever we're in areas that are heavily forested or about to get logged whenever the U.S. Forest Service may be proposing to do logging on, on their property. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, as long as we have, we have best management practices in place for logging, as long as those are followed, it's actually a really a good thing for wildlife because that's actually a disturbance on the landscape. And one of the things we looked at, look at with wildlife, especially forested wildlife, are age structures of the forest. So a lot of our forest is about 80 to 110 years old, which is when we have our last big logging event. And the forests have grown up. There's been some logging, but not at that scale. So we have a lot of older forests. Well, some of our wildlife species may depend on really young forests. For prime example, is grouse. They really need forests between 5 and 15 years old. And at one point, we had about 10 to 20 percent of our forest was under 20 years old. Now, it's in, and that's specifically in the state of Kentucky, and this is a nationwide problem as well, but now our forest is about 5% of that age class. So for a lot of the species that really depend on that younger forest, they're struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, our grouse numbers have plummeted. There's some uh, songbirds that are also having issues. And if we can get in there and log in, in following those best managed practices and remove those areas, we actually can get that disturbance that puts that habitat type back on the landscape, which benefits not only those that depend solely on that habitat structure, uh, but there's been now we've seen evidence that bird species that need that 100-year-old forest, well, when, when the, their baby birds fledge and leave the nest, they actually, we found out that they search out that young forest because it helps them survive better from predators because they're not as good as flying as mom and dad are. Mm -hmm. So if you're not that good at flying and there's not a lot of cover around because your trees are really old, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go look for where those, there's cover where you don't have to fly as well to survive. So there's benefits for not just um, the species that, that need that young forest to survive, but also now we're seeing benefits for other species as well. And early successional forest is great for a lot of our game species, which people are um, always interested in, deer, elk, turkeys, and also insect communities. You have a lot more flowering plants at that age structure than um, older age structures. Okay, so um, question number nine is, can I kill vultures how do I stop them from killing my calves? Sure. So this one is, uh, we have 2.2 million-ish cows in Kentucky. We have the largest herd east of the Mississippi. 
uh, and a lot of producers, uh, over about 30,000 or so cattle producers within the state. And we have an issue relating to wildlife damage of black vultures specifically. We have two, we have two vulture species, turkey vulture and black vultures, but black vultures specifically have uh, actually been killing calves and uh, even cows and adults as they're giving birth or shortly after giving birth or if they get sick, which is somewhat hadn't been really seen prior to about 15 years ago within the state. Uh, but it's as we seem to see more and more vultures, the problems become more prevalent. Uh, so it's one that our producers are quite concerned about. Uh, so we, we've been trying to figure out how big of the problem is this? How do we help producers? Uh, because the big issue with vultures is they're a migratory bird. They're federally protected. So no, you legally cannot shoot them without a permit. Mm -hmm. um, there's ways of getting the permit through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, also, there's sub-permits available through the Kentucky Farm Bureau. But if you don't have one of those permits, you're not legally allowed to kill them or, or injure them or cause them to abandon their nest. So uh, that is all considered a federal wildlife offense and should be taken seriously. But there is a mechanism to get those permits if you are having a problem. But that takes time. And if you're a producer and you look outside and your cow's getting attacked, obviously you don't jump on the computer and fill out a, a permit form. Right. So we're trying to, to work on ways to come up with methods to prevent it from even being a problem. And one of the things that we came up with and are taking advantage of is a evolutionary behavior for those type of birds. So vultures like crows actually have an innate ability uh, to see a dead version of themselves and make a connection saying, that looks like me and it's not doing well. <laughs> maybe I don't want to go land there because maybe I'll end up like that. Mm -hmm. So what we came up with is a design to build a effigy, which is basically a fake dead vulture. It can be a real one uh, if you have a vulture, but we came up with a, how do you come up with a dead vulture without killing one? We have to build one out of, out of rubber. So we designed a, a template to, for producers to use, came up with the directions and they can now cut out a rubber mat and hang it upside down wherever their cats are, are, are getting ready to be born to kind of play on that whole, there's a dead vulture here, I don't want to land on this ground. Well, if the vultures don't touch the ground, they can't kill the calves. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've been working with that as a, one of our methods to help producers. Uh, on top of encouraging them, if they see vultures around, they're about ready to calf to harass them and, and get them to go away. Uh, because as long as you're not injuring them, you are legally allowed to harass them to, to make them uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, vultures will form roosts at night and during the day. And those roosts can be four or 500 birds. Um, so if you have one forming and you're about ready to calf, you probably don't want to have 500 vultures right around. Right. Um, so we encourage them to go out and harass them and make them uncomfortable. You know, they're kind of like us. If you don't want to sleep somewhere, you're getting, you know, noise, air horns going off, lasers and whatnot. So they'll leave the area if um, if you harass them enough. Okay. And so you do have the directions on our website. The on directions are on our website. You can download them. Uh, you can also go on the College of Ag's website um, and uh, find them there as well. On how to build the effigy. On how to build the effigy, right. yes. Okay. So, and then number 10 was, what happened to my hummingbirds? Oh, yes. Um, this is one that I get usually about every June mm -hmm. after people are starting to see hummingbirds uh, around. And um, the thing to keep in mind is that hummingbirds do migrate long distances every year. Uh, they'll go down to the tropics in winter there, and then come spring, usually later in the spring, they'll co start coming up and they breed in the northern part of, the, of our uh, continental U.S. So folks, year in, year out, tend to put hummingbird feeders out. It's fun to watch them fly around. They're very acrobatic. They tend to fight with each other and defensive over those feeders, so it's, they can be very entertaining to watch as they do that. But people sometimes get concerned because they may put out a feeder and not have a hummingbird there that year, or maybe they had 30 birds there the year before and now they have two mm -hmm. um, and there's concerns that the population is crashing uh, or you know something happened and there's a disease the the thing that is um, great about hummingbirds is there um, we have many birds that are struggling right now with populations that are migratory hummingbirds are not uh, all the research is pointing to the slight increase in their numbers however they are given the fact right they migrate thousands of miles a year they're quite mobile 
Mm-hmm. And they will look and try to find areas that have more food to them or there's something there that they're queuing in on, uh, maybe more habitat for them to raise their young. That's going to drive where they are in the landscape more than just where are the feeders. Oh, okay. So you may put out 30 feeders and have one hummingbird there if there is something else that's keying out. Maybe there's 40 cats standing underneath your feeders, <laughs> right. um, which is going to throw a predator response off. So it, it depends on uh, many factors and whether or not you have hummingbirds around. Usually, though, if you have 30 hummingbirds, you're always going to have some, but things do change. Uh, and maybe you need to look at what else is going on around outside of just you putting feeders out. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. And you've presented us a lot of great information with all of these um, top 10 lists, and we'll have all of that listed on our website. Um, What would be one or two key takeaway items that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Sure. So one of them is, um, in extension, we exist and we're here and paid to help you. Don't hesitate to contact your county extension agent or contact us here at Forestry Extension if you have wildlife-related questions. Uh, We're here to help, and if we don't know it off the top of our head, we will find out for you. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's why we are here. And if you do feel like there's something wrong, if you see a sick animal or or, um, a injured animal that looks like something happened that's not really out of the ordinary, right? So predators kill animals all the time, but if something looks off, don't hesitate to call and report it. Um, because, you know, those reports sometimes help head off bigger problems. And, like, you know, we don't have raccoon rabies right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, as soon as we get raccoon rabies, the sooner we find it, the better off we are to control it. So um, same kind of goes for deer diseases and those kind of things. So it's uh, don't hesitate. If you see something wrong, contact us. Or if you just have general wildlife questions or any kind of habitat questions, um, that's why we're here. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. And if you'd like more information on what you've heard in this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. So stay tuned now for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Today we have Dr. Matt Springer with us to talk about that sound that we heard earlier. Let's play it again so we can hear what that is. All right, so tell us what that sound was. So that's an eastern screech owl. So it's our, one of our smallest owls that we have, um, but it's one that is rather boisterous in its uh, auditory levels. Um, so it's, it's one that you can pretty commonly hear across the state of Kentucky. Okay, so how many species of owls do we have? So we actually have uh, records for eight different species of owls. Uh, however, two of those are really, really rare. The snowy owl, so our white owl, right? Our, um, that one is uncommon, and usually in really harsh winters, we may see them come down and hit northern Kentucky, uh, maybe even farther out by Paducah, um, depending on how severe the winters are. Uh, then we also have one that's another northern species, the, uh, the long-eared owl. Uh, similar bow if you have harsher winters we may see that one Um, that one's not as uh, easy uh, to identify like the snowy owl right it's not bright white uh, but it does have really really long tufts on the top of its head that look like long ears Mm -hmm. uh, where it gets its name so those are the species we would see around Lexington then, or are there others as No, well? so those are the rarer of our eight species. The mm-hmm. ones that are more common are the one you heard, the mm-hmm. eastern screech owl. Uh, we also have the ones around Lexington are really the great horned owl, mm-hmm. which sounds like this. So it's that traditional hoo, 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 Mm -hmm. right? Uh, The other really common one is our barred owl, uh, which has this sound. Oh, 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 oh,
so they're quite distinct. It's the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, right? Um, those are the ones that are more common that you may see in town. Uh, small possibility seeing a screech owl, especially when you get further out of town and closer to the edge. But those are, are your, your really more common owl species in general. We also have a small owl that migrates called the northern sawwood owl. Uh, you may see there. Uh, we have a short-eared owl and a barn owl, uh, which are really species of concern within the state of Kentucky. The barn owl is one that um, has somewhere around 50 to 100 nesting pairs within the entire state. Uh, they used to be much more common, now they're not. The short-eared owl uh, is a grassland owl. Uh, we may see it uh, out in western Kentucky, uh, old mine sites, uh, also on the, the mine sites in eastern Kentucky, a little bit more uh, less likely to see it there than, say, central or western Kentucky. Uh, and as grasslands decline, so have they. Mm -hmm. um, but the barn owl is really one that we use, pretty iconic owl species that most people know about uh, that, that isn't doing so great. And are there any other owls in the state that are not faring so well? Uh, so um, owls in general are, are kind of up and down, um, depending on which species you look at. Uh, but those two are really the big ones of concern. Okay. So what do owls eat? So owls really a lot of times will focus on small rodents. So your voles and your mice, uh, and they're really good at it. Um, they they're fly almost completely silent. Uh, and their uh, vision at night allows them to pick up uh, on rodents as they're, you know, say, either running through a field or in the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and their keen sense of hearing with the ears that are a little offset allow them to keep right in on where that mouse is mm -hmm. uh, and then fly to it as quiet as a mouse, unfortunately, <laughs> um, for the mouse. Uh, so they're really a uh, rodents is the big one. Uh, great horned owls are a larger, they're the largest owl we have, and they will take uh, things such as turkeys. Uh, in the tree at night roosting. Uh, they're capable of doing that. They're also super territorial. They've been known to go into osprey nests uh, and kill the osprey, the baby osprey. Um, super territorial, super aggressive. Um, but they'll do, you know, if you have chickens walking around, they're vulnerable. Um, squirrels, rabbits, you know, there's uh, most of the owl species. Barred owls, uh, which are slightly smaller than great horns, will eat squirrels a lot, uh, chipmunks, uh, but mostly small mammals. Okay. So why, why are the owls useful? Well, if that rodent control is a big part of it. Um, one of the things that uh, has been shown, you know, a lot of what I focus on is wildlife damage. One of the things uh, for rodent control and agricultural production, agricultural production is uh, put up owl boxes. Barn owls specifically in many areas will, they'll eat um, dozens and dozens of small mammals a day, especially when they're rearing chicks. It's over, you know, they may catch uh, triple digit small mammals in one day. Hmm. It's a lot. Um, in terms of rodent control. So they're very useful in that setting, uh, especially. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for coming in and doing another Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. We greatly appreciate it. I'm always glad to be here. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky. If you have any questions about things that you heard on today's show, please visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned each Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. for another edition of From the Woods, Kentucky. Hey there, if you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and of course via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.